let's just uh, get this show on the road. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for coming and, and uh, listening to this presentation. Hopefully, uh, we'll all get some out of it. And uh, like I said, I, I like to keep them short and uh, then after maybe have some engaging conversations with all of you, uh, learn about your experiences and, and also what you're up to in regards to the uh, topic. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, continuous delivery for microservices and composable architectures. For me, uh, I define uh, com uh, com composable architectures as exactly what that sounds like, and then a microservice is essentially a form of a composable architecture, right? Uh, so this is a real quick agenda, a little intro about myself. We'll jump into what architectures actually are and then uh, discuss continuous delivery and these composable architectures and then uh, uh, jump into orchestrating and validating uh, change, which is uh, something we'll get a little bit deeper into later. Uh, so my name is Angel Rivera, or Angel Rivera, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, I'm from the United States. I was born and raised in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, so was, but I've traveled all over Europe throughout my career uh, and I currently work at Circle CI as a developer advocate. Uh, who in the room, everybody familiar with developer advocates and what we do? Uh, yeah. So essentially what we do is just go out and do these uh, conferences on behalf of uh, organizations like Circle CI. So they pay me to engage with all of you uh, and essentially learn what you all are up to, uh, you know, the practitioners of technologies, uh, what technologies you're using, how you're using it, how you're building software, uh, because uh, you know, it's just more of intelligence gathering for, for, for me personally. I really enjoy the conversations. I'm passionate about that. Uh, and then uh, also the benefit is uh, I've come back to our company and help our engineering teams build features and capabilities that are actually valuable instead of, you know, letting our engineers kind of guess at what you all need. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'm since the Twitter takeover, I'm uh, not using the platform uh, so much these days, but if you need me, I do check it uh, at least once a day just to see if anyone uh, wants to engage. Uh, this is my Twitter handle, my GitHub. Uh, and if, yeah, if you want to engage, I'm more than happy to uh, jump in. And by the way, on LinkedIn, uh, I don't have it here, but Punk Data is my LinkedIn name as well. So you can find me pretty much on all those platforms. A uh, little bit about myself, uh, I consider myself a developer, I've always identified as a developer, uh, but always with operational tendencies, uh, which means that uh, I started programming professionally in 1994, I was a uh, part of the United States Air Force, I was enlisted uh, for four and a half years, I was working uh, as a satellite command and control operator, so they trained me in how to drive satellites, uh, primarily secure communications and GPS. Uh, and I was stationed at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, which is in uh, Kennedy Space Center. And back then we were launching humans into space in the space shuttle program. And from the looks of the audience, I can see that a lot of faces probably of similar age as myself. Uh, so yeah, I was a very young man uh, working in these really critical uh, systems, right? Uh, learning how to program them and maintain them and administer them. So that's why I, I kind of lean towards more the operational side of things. Uh, but in my whole entire career, Career, I was integrating systems with systems, right? Getting them to talk to each other in an automated manner, which is still my passion. So again, uh, I identify as a developer, but I lean more towards to the operational side of things, which is where my sweet spot is. I've done pretty much uh, every kind of programming in the book, uh, front end, back end, what a database programming, whatever you want to call it. I've worked uh, with uh, in security uh, uh, conditions, postures, mainframes, IoT, networking even, right? Like just a lot of touching around, uh, touching all the disciplines uh, within technology. And also served as a management uh, for developer and operational teams. Uh, again, just wanted to kind of give you a little background on myself so you understand uh, where my point of view is coming from. Uh, so let's talk about architectures. How many people in the room are developers or identify as a developer? Okay, two. And the rest of you all, I assume, are operations or some form? Awesome. We're good. 
my crowd. All right, so uh, this is kind of level setting for the folks who are not familiar with the material. So, uh, you know, I like to always define things when I'm talking about them. So let's talk about architectures. What are they? I like to, you know, use the dictionary uh, uh, definitions and obviously I'm not going to read it to you but it's the practice right of designing and building infrastructures uh, for uh, well uh, sorry this is the definition right the other the definition I wanted to focus in on was this one right it's the manner of which uh, the components of a computer program system are organized and integrated right like that's the context that we're going to be talking about that I just wanted to show you there's a lot of definitions for for architectures but the one we're focusing on is this one so uh, as we all know right uh, there's different types of architectures in our business. Uh, sometimes it can be referring to a microchip, infrastructure, systems as in a general sense, applications, network, databases, right? These are all forms of architectures that we all need and, and depend on to get our end results with in the digital age. Um, so a system architecture, right? It's a model that defines uh, the structures and behaviors of multiple components and subsystems, right? Uh, and that includes all of the things, right? Hardware, software, uh, networking, memory, whatever you need to get a system up and running, that's what that kind of architecture looks like. Uh, this is something I cribbed off of the internet to show, right, a fully functional kind of AWS cloudy uh, infrastructure, uh, how many people manage something similar to this in their day to day? All right. Yeah, I, I used to, uh, <laughs> I, but I primarily lived in the database space for a long time, uh, which is kind of the where all the pain points usually come from, right? Like the persistence layers are always, there's so many uh, details that you have to watch and monitor. Um, so today though we're going to focus on the application aspect of architectures uh, and this is a definition that i kind of curved again off the internet um, but i'm not going to read it to you the things i really would like you to focus on in this definition is basically the patterns to design and build applications that the most important piece of this is that meet the business requirement right so we all work for organizations that probably pay us a paycheck or, or we, you know, contribute to projects, but at the end of the day, we're achieving a certain goal and it's usually related to some business requirements, right? Now, we've all seen similar diagrams, right? Like this is this simple architecture, fairly simple archi uh, uh, architecture, application architecture, where we have, you know, the web interface layer, then you may have some uh, RESTful APIs, and then within that, you have a module that controls the data flow, and then, you know, up and down goes through that system, it hits your persistence layers, and then there's other services that are running in the background to uh, control that whole application and, and basically provide the service that, uh, that, that you are intending for users to use. Now, we have two types generally that uh, I'm gonna focus in on today about application architectures, the monolithic and uh, what I call composable. Uh, also, we can refer to it as microservices if you like. Um, how many people in the room are operating, and you could probably be doing both, but uh, monolithic uh, type of platforms or services today. Yeah, I, 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 I still consult a little bit and I still work in a lot of organizations that haven't really gone through that transformation. How many folks have gone through a transformation uh, to microservices in the room? Okay, there's a little more, that's good, all right. So with the monolithic architectures, right, we all know, um, it's designed as an independent consolidated application for the most part, simple definition. This is kind of what it looks like. This is <laughs> bringing me back to the old days, right? 1994, where I was working on many, many mainframe systems. Um, and then, right, we all have these dummy terminals that basically just were connected via D-ring tokens or some other coax cable. <laughs> I, I've seen it all. Uh, but today, commonly, right, it's either some wireless system or uh, your mobile phone or, or an Ethernet cable. Now, um, monolithic architecture with a, you know, N tier, meaning there's multiple tiers, and the, in this case, I'm just showing you where the one tier is a, the persistence layer, which is the database layer. Uh, and then, right, we have all the, app, we have the application kind of housing all of the services within it. Um, 
And yeah, just showing like again, level setting everyone. The cons of monolithic architecture. These are just some of the ones that kind of came to the top of my head when I wrote this. Um, but for the most part, right, uh, when I was working in, in, and developing in this monolithic architectures, uh, we have fixed application service models, right? Uh, they're difficult to maintain. And this was one of the pain points I, I saw wholeheartedly all over the place was, uh, you know, maintaining the code base efficiently as a team at scale, uh, especially when you're doing, you know, rewrites of things. It's really hard. It was really hard to collaborate on this stuff. And it still is today. It's a lot better with the tools, but it still can be uh, quite a problem. Uh, it was very difficult to integrate and maintain, right, with other services, especially if they were modern, um, just because a lot of times when we're dealing with monolithic, it tends to lean towards a like more legacy type uh, technologies, right? And then we start trying to build wedges in between things, so now you're adding <laughs> more complexity to this application that probably should be rewritten at some point. Uh, but then again, right, like sometimes we can't do that, and that's okay too, uh, but that's where like kind of microservices can come in and help. Uh, also, it's this is really a, a pain point as well. Is it's really hard to leverage modern uh, software development practices, you know, to implement them and use them on a monolithic architecture. And uh, the reason why is, I, for me, in my experience, it's about the human beings and not being able to, uh, like with all the cultures, right, uh, be able to collaborate around this. So you have camps that are like, oh, we're the monolithic camp or the legacy, sometimes they call them legacy type operators. Uh, and then you have the, the, the newer, edgier type uh, of, of developers that want to like, implement the new things. So how many in the room have practiced waterfall? Yeah, me too. And obviously, right, we, the waterfall development is a more of a sequential, right, block after block. You kind of have to finish the tasks before uh, in order to get to the, to the bottom layer tasks. In, in general, right, I've seen different uh, variations of this take place at different organizations and teams. But in general, it's a very structured, slow, and blocking process. Whereas, you know, we got smarter as engineers and we started developing software in more of a smaller scale smaller scope and we were able to then start doing things concurrently right so that sped things up a lot and as you can see right the waterfall development diagram just kind of goes boom 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 cascading and the scrum or the uh, agile development is more of a, you know a lot of movement in but again in smaller scales and then eventually everything kind of just circles back into a centrally managed uh, a system so <clears throat> Some of the modern day software development practice I was talking about, uh, I kind of showed you one already, it's an agile software development practices. Uh, continuous delivery, which isn't new, but it's a little, a lot more modern than the stuff that um, I came up with. Uh, but there are always advancements in this, right? And that's where kind of where Circle CI lives in that space. Um, and you probably also know it as uh, the continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. And now um, what's becoming re more and more popular, uh, especially in software development, is release management processes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Is everyone here, uh, anyone here operating under like release management uh, processes or release management teams? One person, okay. Yep, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things like depending on where I am and, and what city I'm in, it, it can, be more people that are doing it, but it is becoming uh, more popular. And that's one of the things that I forgot to mention. Uh, and during this job, uh, I get to speak to thousands of people, and I am able to kind of, you know, uh, capture information about uh, what people, what, what process people are using or implementing, and release management in the, I would say after post-COVID, the events I'm going to, I'm having a lot more discussions and folks are, you know, conveying that the release management practices are becoming uh, more dominant. 
so the commonalities of these things, right? Like why are these people uh, implementing these processes? Because again, um, we're able to produce things uh, a lot faster because we're limiting the scope and we're becoming hyper-focused on things. And when you have that situation, that also uh, results in increased efficiency. So if, if you're able to focus on something, you're able to generally get it done faster and then you're also able to identify patterns that will help you uh, you know refine those those uh, the good things about your your processes and, and make them even better right so um, let's talk about composable architectures since we kind of went through the monolithic um, they're designed to be very specific in functionality and less complex and extremely modular, right? So that means uh, you no longer have this big thing you have to update. It's the, the stuff is broken out into smaller, more manageable pieces, right? And again, they come in many flavors, right? Composable architectures. Uh, I'm going to focus on microservices because it is the most dominant, uh, especially in all my conversations, right? Everyone's kind of like focused on let's decouple our or decompose our, our, our monolith and the services into microservices. But that comes with a lot of uh, headache <laughs> and, and obstacles. Again, right, I'm not going to go super deep, but, uh, you know, uh, we're going to talk about the decomposing of the monolith, right? So that was a picture of a monolith, and when you kind of decompose it, this is generally what something like an application would look like. Uh, in, the, in the previous one, you had a one database, right, and everything was kind of uh, running off of that system. Um, now you will need to, like, you know, the, the complexity just it got grew exponentially. Uh, generally what happens is you, you build a small service, but then you have to add layers of, uh, of other services to support it, which is generally in a RESTful API sense, right? There's other protocols you could use, but in general, these days, people are just starting with the RESTful APIs. And then every, as you can see in this architecture, every service now needs its own persistence layer, right? Because they have to be isolated and independent, or they should be, to, to be qualified as a proper microservice the way that uh, they intended it to work. Um, so I just want to show like a quick flow. So let's say users make a request to the, like a user dashboard in a microservice, that dashboard then sends that request forward to maybe uh, the users updating a password or something. It goes to the user service and then the, the backend APIs start talking to one another, right, and processing the information and then eventually that uh, uh, conducts the transaction for the user. Um, and again, I showed you that, right, we broke apart this monolith and we have these four different applications now. Uh, not only does that make your architect, your actual uh, architecture infrastructure more complex, it also adds layers of complexity to the way you write the code for your application. So instead of having, I mean, and by the way, this is an example. You may, you, you obviously can use a mono repo. Uh, I am in the non-mono repo camp most of the time, but you do whatever makes sense to you. Uh, and I have my reasons, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but for the most part, uh, generally what happens is people start also decoupling the code base, right? And now you have, instead of one repo, you have four. And for continuous delivery, it makes much more sense, this model makes much more sense. And, I, and the reason is uh, the current systems out there, uh, they're not really wired or, or designed to handle uh, interactivity, right, between services yet. Uh, I think we're getting a lot smarter about how we want to achieve that, but it takes a lot of, um, of uh, rolling of your own kind of uh, CI CD systems to achieve that. It, with Kubernetes uh, and the, uh, like Argo CD and all these other things, it's becoming a little bit easier. But again, right, you're doing like a holistic platform approach. Anyway, so the other approach is the mono repo, right, where everything just still lives and you generally separate things into separate uh, folders, right, or directories. Um, as you can see, right, I just have an example of all the services in their own little folder and then within that is where all the code lives. So let's talk about how continuous delivery and composable architectures kind of get along. Uh, continuous delivery, right, uh, I'm sure everybody here is familiar, but it's just basically the practice of building, testing, and delivering changes to code uh, and user environments, right, using automation. 
This is kind of just a diagram of what the automation and uh, what we call a CICD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline would look like. Uh, as you can see, you have some code, it changes. Our automation, which is the CICD runtime, takes over, starts doing the things that you would do manually and you know, starts maybe testing your code, maybe doing some security scans, building images, and then you can also, right, the next stage would be to deploy these changes to something like maybe a Kubernetes cluster. And then at the end of it, the user is able to, if everything goes well, the user is able to start using these changes, right, in the application. Um, so right, so we have this monolithic code base, uh, consolidated execution, it's, it's, this is kind of like um, the comparison I'm making is basically <laughs> we have the ability to now right, decompose these monolithic applications, uh, provide uh, the uh, architecture of those uh, applications individually, and, but we still run our pipelines sort of in a monolithic sense if that makes sense, right? Like, I, I hear this all the time where it's, yeah, we have microservices, but we only have one pipeline to do all the work for all those microservices. Now, some people make it work, but it, it, they, it takes a lot of effort to, to first design and get it working and then also maintaining it. It's one of the things that I hear all the time and I've experienced myself. So, you know, again, uh, some of the problems that we have are the tools are not really set up. Uh, this morning we heard a talk of, uh, of uh, from uh, Ulf, I think he's in the room, there he is, uh, and he was talking about Jenkins, right? And he was, you know, if you got his talk, he was hiding, his team's is hiding Jenkins from the developers, the ugly parts of Jenkins, for a reason, a good reason. It's because it takes a lot of effort to manage uh, those systems and then also manage and orchestrate those pipelines, right? Uh, so with microservices, that problem also becomes exponentially harder because you will have to then, right, if you go with the monolithic model, you're, your continuous delivery workflows, if you have one pipeline, will become very complex. If you implement this, you know, uh, consolid or uh, individual uh, code base uh, pipeline approach and mono uh, uh, repo approach, then you will have four different pipelines for the services. So you have to kind of pick your poison. I would recommend this <laughs> if you're able to, uh, because yeah, you have four different poisons, but at the end of the day, they're a little bit more manageable uh, from experience and from conversations. So. For those of you that don't know, generally um, the systems today are triggered, uh, the pipelines are triggered usually for a, for a get push upstream. How many people trigger their pipelines uh, without a get push, like another, uh, another trigger? You have a system that does that, right? Okay, yeah, this is the common, right, general one, so people are most familiar with. Uh, we're working on actually decoupling from that as well so that, you know, it doesn't matter. You can be able to trigger things because the reality is we want to trigger our pipelines not just on code changes. It could be some other uh, change that we want to do, right? Maybe another service uh, can act, trigger pipelines, whatever the reason, uh, but this is the common one. So when we do the, like, a pipeline execution, right, I'm just going to show you a quick example. Let's say the dashboard again. Somebody hits that user uh, service. Uh, maybe we're going to build a, our pipeline is going to build an artifact, right, to then be deployed. And that's what I'm showing you here is a simple kind of like, hey, this dashboard UI changed and I want to uh, create a new artifact for this dashboard UI, but I also need to ensure in my test that the user service, <laughs> the, or a version of the user service is compatible, right, with uh, dashboard UI. And, and the reality of things is I'm just showing you one service, but probably all of your services will need to be tested that are you know, uh, d dependent or the dashboard UI is dependent on. Uh, so again, right, like it gets really, really complex. And what this is the number one problem. So all of you out there who are using microservices, uh, is, is the which version should we test against a problem for you? Yeah, no? It's a problem for me, it's a problem for a lot of folks. Because yeah, you have this dashboard UI, you update it, but now you have to make sure, right, integration tests, make sure that these things are working. Uh, but how do you automate which version? 
uh, to do it, right, to, to test against. Do you test all the things, all the versions? No, I think that would be inefficient. Uh, some people do it. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's definitely, it takes, their builds, you know, grow in, in, in length. So how can we produce microservices, right? The, the, the microservice compatible pipelines that can uh, reliably, consistently build and deploy the changes confidently. Um, one of the methods that I'm going to kind of talk about today is validating, focusing on validating and orchestrating the changes individually instead of the whole. And that's gonna bring us into the orchestration validation change. So now that we've decomposed our monolith, we've created uh, you know, uh, these, these architectures now that are isolated and, and running independently, you know, just because we house them in different, maybe different monorepos or, or in a monorepo in different folders, or we've separated out into four different repositories. Those are kind of like the top layer changes that you made. But what I'm proposing is, uh, and, and this has kind of worked out for me in my career, I've always had maintained this type of uh, mentality with my teams is, we need to decompose our application structure, meaning the way we uh, design and, and essentially store the code base, right? So decouple the code base from the other things that I call digital assets. So, and the reason for this is, you know, as, as we start getting into like the release team management, or the release, yeah, release management teams and, and people uh, are expanding that bubble, right, that technology bubble. Back in the day, developers and, and sysadmins were the ones calling the shots with technology because no one else really knew, right, all about how these things worked. We were basically the magicians in the room. Uh, that's changed, right? Now everything's more product-based, so now you have folks that are monitoring. They're a little bit more tech-savvy. They understand that, uh, you know, the, the stuff that the developers and the sysadmins are doing is contributing directly into the revenue, right, with all these software businesses. So that, that landscape is changing and it's leaning more towards uh, the product managers, right, release managers are controlling those things, which I think is, is the right way. Uh, that lets the, the technical teams focus on what they really need to focus on, which is the technology. So with all these changes, right, um, we are not the only ones. Now we're, in, we're, we're uh, integrating uh, security a lot more, right, into, into the application uh, building process. Uh, I can tell you back in the day, I used to write applications, my teams would write applications, and then we were ready to, to uh, deploy, and the blocker was, anyone want to take a guess, like right before we deployed, what the, what the blocker almost always was? What, what was that? DNS. DNS? No, yeah. yeah, that was, that was a, yeah, the old bind system. No, uh, security, right? These jokers would get their hands on it and go, no, it doesn't match any of our you know, requirements, blah, blah, blah. So now, right, we're getting smarter. We're, we're integrating these security tools uh, into the, the, the pipelines. So our developers, I mean, I, I cared about security, but I was not the expert, right? Uh, I relied on other folks to tell me no. Now we have tools that we integrate into our pipelines that do that for us, which is great. Stops uh, the, the problems up front or identifies the problems up front. Uh, but the, my point here is the developers are, are now and, and operators are not the only ones contributing uh, changes to applications, right? Security, uh, product managers, release managers, all these folks have a say. And it's, it's the right thing, right, for the business. So developing software is obviously a team effort, right? And we're going to have to get used to this. <laughs> we are no longer the big dogs in the room as developers and operators. We are part of the team now. Um, so let's talk about the application structure. This is all leading up to, uh, I'm just showing you an example of maybe that dashboard UI application and how uh, we generally see things, right? Uh, uh, Ulf also talked about this morning, one of my favorites, the version, uh, version control systems. It's still, it's still cool, I, I don't care what anyone thinks, uh, Git was great, uh, but at the end of the day, um, this is generally, right, like I, I'm just using a website as, a, as an example, uh, but I never understood why we 
as uh, developers and teams put images, even for a website, inside of our, and version them inside of our, our code bases. I, that was a big no-no in my teams, and I still hold that, <laughs> that, that rule, uh, because the version control systems are not, uh, they're not efficient once they hit a certain capacity, right? The indexing gets too too big, just like any other like data system, right? It's, if you have too much information and the system can't keep up with processing it, why do you have this information that you already are really don't need to be pairing up with your code base? So number one, we're going to talk about application structure and the images. We'll focus on that. Again, why do they live there? Uh, the reason is we want everything in a one-stop shop, right? That, like, okay, I can go to one place and see all the assets for my application, uh, but in reality, yeah, it's kind of a nice to have, but not very necessary. Uh, and I would recommend you reassess what you're doing in that application structure and all the bits that can kind of live somewhere else. Uh, remove them, right? De decompose them, just like that microservice. Uh, and they all should not live in Git, right? There shouldn't be multiple images living in Git. Also, why do you want a person? Git is a complicated system, right? Like, I struggle, and I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you know, merge conflicts and then uh, taking and rebasing, and, and it just adds layers and layers of like un, un, unnecessary uh, uh, friction, be, especially if it's a person like a, a graphic designer, and that's why I'm using images. We give these people <laughs> control. Uh, over our source code, and they don't even know fuck all about, right? Uh, uh, code, most of them don't. They just want to do their images and, you know, get you a bunch of sizes that you need for your site and be done with it. So, again, one of the other, like, reasons why I don't allow it is because I don't want folks that are, that shouldn't be in there, you know, work, working and, and kind of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, yeah, causing havoc in, in the system. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So I call those things, the things like images, right? They're, they're, they are critical elements to your application, but that are not source code. So we'll just use them, we'll just define them as digital assets. So going back to our example, um, decoupling, right, the, that application architecture I believe is really important, and this is the reason why. Why are you versioning images in a in our VCS, right? And then you're only going to go and deploy that to S3 anyway, right? You're going to serve those images. This is what happens all the time. Um, so why are they even? Aside from like, yeah, it's nice to have everything in one place, but um, why don't you just leave it in S3 and let that version? Now I know back in the day S3 didn't have versioning, but it does now. And it's a place where like your developer, or, uh, like your graphic designer, they're used to S3, right? They understand that. It's a simple upload, download situation. Um, and you can keep all that stuff there where you're going to serve from anyway, right? So this is just a different perspective on how to decouple your application structure and then kind of separate the concerns so that the developers are focusing in on the things and the tools that they use day in, day out with uh, reduced friction from external <laughs> entities that really don't want to be using those tools and don't understand the tools. So it, I'm closing up here, but uh, digital assets can exist outside of your code, as I showed you, right, the S3 example. It's very popular these days. Um, meet your developers or non-developers where they are and not in your repos. It's really important. Uh, I've done this many, many times where I've gone into organizations that were like all-in-ones and then I start slowly teasing things out. And believe it or not, it's such a great morale booster. People start understanding their, you know, their boundaries and, and then they're a lot more helpful to each other because they're like, yeah, you know, I'm in S3, you're in, in, in Git, the friction is gone, there's no more uh, mistakes by, you know, uh, graphic designers uh, creating merge conflicts, and it sped up our releases quite a bit, actually, uh, you know. So, again, right, like just use these, uh, this advice to provide new perspectives uh, amongst your teams, and also, you know, revisit your mechanisms to 
basically work smarter, not harder, right? Some of the stuff you're doing that you probably inherited, like I did lots of times, uh, it doesn't mean, you know, just because you inherited it and it worked doesn't mean it's the right way, right? Uh, try to look at those things from a different perspective and look at it, you know, how you can tease things out, maybe isolate your, your work in a certain way. Uh, and that's, again, validating those changes that I was talking about. And uh, Basically, your pipelines should not be concerned about you know, the locations of, I'm missing a word here, the locations of your source code or your, your digital assets, right? Like you can, like I showed you in that example, you can actually probably work a lot faster and, less, and a lot cleaner if you just take a little bit of time and kind of organize the application structure uh, to your needs, right? Everyone's kind of different. Everyone builds software different, but if you can standardize, uh, which is one of the other points of me today, uh, you can actually achieve a lot of efficiencies. So I think, uh, yeah, this is the point. Uh, decoupling uh, your digital assets from your code helps in definitely building microservices that are compatible, right? Pipelines that will kind of help you understand your changes and the validation of those changes. Uh, so in closing, uh, if you are interested in uh, benchmarks for uh, what we at CircleCI call high-performing teams, uh, we release this annual report where uh, we have, you know, we build software for a ton of uh, companies and, and, and teams, so we have a lot of performance data, basically very anonymized, right? We're not talking specific companies, but what we do is aggregate the information and we uh, provide information uh, based off of our usage and our performance on our systems by our customers, uh, what we call the state of software delivery report. So it's a nice report to kind of, if you're trying to start benchmarking, you know, your performance uh, based off of your continuous delivery, um, you can get this free report that we produce, uh, and it's, it's got some good information in there about how, you know, what, what kind of benchmarks you could be looking at and then start a starting point for you to build your own. Uh, I, I recommend if you're interested in, in yeah, increasing performance uh, on, the, on the software release side, it's probably give you some information. So, uh, and I was, my colleague uh, Jean just told me earlier that uh, we probably will be releasing, I don't want to give a time frame, but very soon, within the next month. Uh, uh, the, the next, this year, the 20, is it 2023? Right, yeah, okay, cool. So uh, I think that's it. I hope uh, we got something out of this, and then yeah, let's have some conversations. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, uh, more than happy to, or just have a conversation, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> So is there anybody want to like, want to call bullshit on me or <laughs> or no? Oh, come on, there's got to be one. I can't leave. Does anybody like mono repos? Who likes mono repos in the room? Raise your hand. Wow, huh? I know you do. <laughs> I got that. So all right. Well. If nobody wants to talk to me, we're good. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I appreciate you all. And uh, yeah, if you see me, we can have a beer or something. What was that? This? Oh, the workshop. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, tomorrow, John and I will be doing a 9 o'clock in the morning. I don't know who picked the time, but in the morning, a uh, workshop on continuous delivery and Terraform. So if you want to play around uh, with Terraform and some continuous delivery pipelines, we have a nice, I think we have a nice thing. And it has Kubernetes and Terraform and Sneak security. So yeah, come on by if you're, if you're interested. We're gonna be using some digital ocean, not AWS. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Very relaxed uh, thing and it'll be interactive. So thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.